Australia, the wide brown land. For close to two centuries, our economy rode on the sheep's back. But things have changed. Today, over three million Australians live below the poverty line. And for those still trying to make a living in the country, the struggle's never been so real. In this series, we'll meet those who depend on the land. Water is, is the lifeblood of our farm. Battling a drought that could become the worst in 400 years. The last two years have been the most difficult. A very frightening time because you just don't know when droughts are going to end. And it's not just the farmers. Some regional towns are doing it tough too. I, I worry about my children's safety every day. Every single day. We're going to get rocks thrown at us. It's, there we go. Feeling abandoned. My house is trash, mate. I've got knives, I've got bloody iron bars and everything in my place. Some country Australians have had enough. The ball went in the fucking window after it hit the mirror. Who the fuck are you, mate? Fuck off! Cars have been stolen and they dump them on our oval and they burn them. Like there was flames. <laughs> With emergency services stretched. It's the worst suburb that I've ever lived in. Limited access to health services. He's had seizures, bone disease, got kidney disease. And some struggling to even put a roof over their head. There's plenty of people breaking the laws. Why are they picking on me for? Are rural Australians fed up? I don't think city people really understand what we're going through at all. And ready to leave? I don't think there's a future here. The country's gone mad. Southwest New South Wales, a region known as the Riverina. It's one of the most productive and agriculturally diverse areas in the country. They call it the food bowl of Australia. But one of the worst droughts on record is making life tough. The cost of water, the cost of grain, uh, Potter, everything just keeps going up. National labour shortages and complicated government water allocations. It's a story familiar to farmers in many parts of the country. We're getting stuffed around by the water situation at the moment. It just doesn't make sense. The enthusiasm for the industry is, for, for most people, it's, it's, it's disappearing. Towards the Victorian border on the southwest fringe of the Riverina is the town of Daniloquin, or Denny, to the locals. Denny produces rice, wool, timber, and dairy. But milk production levels are down, and the only thing that will solve that is rain. Barry and Rosie are dairy farmers. They're also parents to two-year-old Annabella and five-year-old Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Come on, let's go. It's 6 a.m. in the morning and it's 30, over 33 degrees. <laughs> Forecast today is 47 degrees, which is probably one of the hottest days in the year. So we've, we've had a, a drought, so you know, we haven't had a, a decent year now in over four years. Barry runs 350 head of dairy cows. I know most of them without looking at their tags. And a fair few of them actually don't have tags, and I probably still know them. It's a job that's been in Barry's family for four generations. It's the only thing I've ever done during my life, and you, hey, you've got a job every day of the year. Oh, I'm going to be 54 tomorrow, and Rosie's 49, and uh, at our age, it gets harder and harder to do what you have to do. And that includes twice daily with kids in tow. Hey, very farmer's wife. Don't marry one. <laughs> How come? It's hard work. It's hard, long hours. Prior to meeting Rosie, 
Barry struggled through the millennial drought on his own. and the drought is one challenge. Being underpaid for your product makes it even tougher. We have had a massive drop in our milk price. Since 2011, the dairy industry has been at odds with the major supermarket chains on fixed price milk. Uh, the price we are getting, um, yeah, it's just you can't make money. There's just no way you can make money. I heard another local farmer tell me that one of the main Victorian manufacturers are not expecting to have any, any farmers left on this side of the border um, by the time this drought finishes because yeah, the, the, the milk price that the manufacturers can pay, uh, it's, just, yeah, it's just too low. You know, it's been the perfect storm. Um, low milk prices, low rainfall, and this year it's, uh, the, the, the heat's been really high. With the cost of running the farm higher than their paycheck, time is running out for Barry and Rosie. I don't think there's a future here. Oh, I believe there's only about 55 days left of feed and water that we have available to us. And unless something changes, then there's no future for dairying here in this place. You would definitely feel like you've failed if, if you had to yeah, sell the cows. I don't ever intend to get to that stage that you just have to give up. Across the country, when farmers are feeling the pinch, you don't have to look far to see the knock-on effects. Less money to spend in town means many places have been hit hard. It's a domino effect that has small business across the country closing their doors. The farmers don't have rain, then, um, so they don't have the money then to come into town to spend the money. So they won't come in, they won't go to a restaurant, they won't go to a coffee shop because they don't have the money. The money needs to be put back into the farm. Some folk drift to the capital cities, others to regional centres like Wagga Wagga. Well, I guess it's basically pretty much your big Aussie town, sort of like, everyone still knows everyone and several, everyone's still pretty like true blue, I guess. For those who find work, the rewards can be great. Wagga is a good area, there's lots of support and lots of help. I find it safe here and my kids really love being here. It's a friendly place. But like any city, there are always those struggling on the fringe. Five kilometres south of the CBD, suburbs Ashmont and Tolland paint a very different picture. They just call Ashmont Trashmont. <laughs> Ashmont? People in Sydney know the name Ashmont. It's mainly housing commission and low-income families. It's just all darrows and bogans and gronks. And a lot of the major problems here is because people have nothing to do, they like to do drugs. They stole my cars and stuff and domestic violence, drugs. Oh, mate, there's that many druggies coming to the place. The area's become a hot spot for a particular kind of crime. Cars stolen and burnt out and houses on fire. In 2018, over 140 cars were stolen and set alight in the streets around here. It's been chaos. Cars have been burned out and stolen. Of course I'm worried. You know, you'd be mad not to be worried. Neither my cat won't even come out sometimes. Wagga Wagga also makes the top ten for home burglaries in New South Wales. Went away looking after a mate, and um, I come back this morning, and everything out of my house is gone. My TVs, my kids' jewellery, everything. 28-year-old Mason lives in Tolland with his two-year-old daughter, Susiana, 
and her mother, Catherine. This is me, Landrum. Calm down. There's jewelry boxes up like the hallway and like smashed up phones and stuff. Visiting a friend for the night, Mason and Catherine have returned to find their housing commission home ransacked. Through the laundry cupboard. She, they've been through that cupboard. My mum's great, great grandmother's ring was in the bedroom and now that's gone. They even went through the pantry. Even went through my cupboards. Went through my medicine cabinets. Mason and Catherine see the house as more than just four walls and a roof. Been here what, just over three years. I was just over 12 weeks pregnant. <laughs> Sorry. And, um... I can't believe it. <laughs> with the house in disarray, two-year-old Susiana is staying with family. I brought my daughter her very first bracelet, and that's gone. Wish it wasn't so personal, and that's how it is when they've been in your home. You know, obviously, you've got to move on, you know. We've got a little girl to think about. I don't, want, I don't want Susan to back here while it's like this. Yeah, I don't want her in this house like this either. I don't care about the materialistic shit. It's the jewellery that we can't replace. Family friend Ethan has come over to lend some support. Oh, that had done to me too, so I know the feeling, but just for people that would do anything for anyone, take their own clothes off their own back, you know what I mean? Like, could be walking down the road with no shoes on and you know what I mean, they'd feel sorry for you and run out with a pair of shoes here. Like, oh, we may as well sit down and watch TV, eh? <laughs> See what's on the idiot box. You yeah. don't mind if I intervene and watch TV? No, you my brother, you watch TV too. <laughs> Ethan's visually impaired, he can't see, <laughs> so it works great for him. A spare set of keys is missing. Catherine calls public housing to replace the locks. Um, I've had my house broken into um, during the night and they've taken um, house keys. Why is it taking so long? Oh, because I've sat on the floor and I've cried for hours. Look, and that, I, I, the first thing, I didn't think, my house is trash, mate, from the ground up. I did not realise the key, a set of keys were even being taken. But when you're down, sometimes things only get worse. <laughs> Public housing informed them that they need to buy the locks themselves. She, like, she even Googled how she, much the locks were from Bunnings. Yeah, to tell me, it's all right, it's only 56 bucks. Yeah, it's yeah, for you, we can't sweet. afford it, like six, Yeah, I was like, oh yeah, bucks. no worries. With Mason currently looking for work and Catherine raising two-year-old Susiana as a stay-at-home mum, absorbing the cost isn't easy. She even said, oh. Yeah, get hold of Mission Australia or Docs, you know. Tell them you're worried about your welfare and your kids' welfare. Station. I've rang the police, they're on their way. Police come. Um, more just to check in, make sure we're right. When the police can't help, you're on your own. I don't know, if they don't catch them, I'll find them, I'll break their fingers or... I'll burn them so they can't steal nothing else. Well... I'm more angry and upset for my daughter's shit, nothing else. Like, I, I am upset oh for everything God, else. Look, Mason, look. What? The bracelets. Oh, yours <laughs> oh, yeah. Oi, the gold bracelets are here. Yes. I found my mum's ring. Fuck off. I'm dead set, look. <laughs> That's all I cared about. Fuck. I just want to ring my brother and let him know. Fuck this gum, bud. Do you want me to hold him? Nah, it's all good. You sure? Oh yeah, just put on the Put him in my bum bag. It's a bit of a relief. I'm surprised. So now I just want to get Mason's grandmother's ring back. Here you go, bros. Because that was only only just handed over to him. Not something he, you know, could have passed on to his daughter. 
Recovering some of the jewellery is a small consolation when you don't feel safe in your own home. It's not that I don't want to stay, I do. I don't know, I don't know. I, just, I don't want to think about it, I'm trying to laugh and just get through. I'm just cranky because it is my home. I want to, yeah, I want to be able to stay home. I can't fucking believe it, hey. One in seven Australians are aged 65 years or older. One third of those on the aged pension rely on it as their main source of income. Which is tough when it's not much more than the poverty line. Well, well pensions are struggling. We're paid for our pension and the politicians are stealing. And I mean stealing. Wilkes Park in North Wagga is a free caravan site, popular with older Australians enjoying their retirement. As well as the grey nomads, the park is home to some more permanent residents, including 72-year-old Bob. Look at me, I don't look that old, but I am 72, believe it. No, not many people believe me. A simple tent has always been his home, but for the past eight months, he's been renovating. That's my tent. I've had that for, for the last five years. And then I found this shelf here up uh, out in the bushes here. So I brought that over and I said, oh, well, that'll be good for putting my cups and saucers on and everything. I found this gas bottle and I said to myself, well, now I've got, got an eight kilo gas bottle, I'm gonna have to buy a stove. So I went down and I spent $120 and I brought this nice cast iron two burner stove and it does everything I want it to do. This bucket here is for, the, is for what I bath in and all I do is get the hot water from here and just tip it, and just tip it over myself like that, a whole bucket and there, bingo. You wouldn't even know I'm camping out. Having a place to call home is every Australian's dream. But early on in life, Bob didn't have a home or a family. My mother decided she, she would get rid of us. She packed all our gear one Saturday afternoon. She said, oh, we're going on a long drive. Then she parked inside the uh, car park at the boys' home and grabbed me by the arm and she said, come on, you little bastard, and dragged me in. And then she knocked on the door and she says, I don't want him now. You can have him. She just got handed the uh, Salvation Army lady a note with my birth date on it and my name, and that's all. And then she just left. And she never even looked, looked back at me. I was seven when I went in. I do need a haircut, but I'm going to get one tomorrow. Bob left the care of the Salvation Army at the age of 18. Like many young men, he was conscripted to fight in Vietnam. Luckily for Bob, the war ended before he saw any action. And after returning home, he hit the road on a different tour. One day I was reading a magazine and I saw this photo of this bloke and this woman on a push bike riding and I read it and they were riding around Australia. And I said, good Bob, you just found yourself a lifestyle. I've been travelling around on my push bike now for 41 years. I have always done seasonal work. I start in New South Wales, go to Queensland, I go to Perth, I do all sorts. I do garlic, onions, apples, oranges, pears, chipping, uh, cotton. I've done all the seasonal work, every single one that you can think of. After countless jobs and hundreds of thousands of kilometres, Bob's finally had to call it quits. I fell off my bike 
And then one thing led to another and I found out that I had the largest and the most complicated cataract that they'd ever seen in their, history, in their medical career and I'm still suffering from it. Bob needs an operation. And with surgeons as rare as hen's teeth in the bush, he's going to have to stay put. For now, at least. Well, I've got to have an operation. That's going to cost it over six grand. So I'm camping out here so I can save the money up to pay for that. Like one third of older Australians, Bob gets by on the age pension. Payments vary, but typically it's around $463 a week. People turn around and, and, and look upon you and say, oh, he's a bludger. He's a bludger. He's bludging off the government. No, no, I get my pension, but you know how much tax I've paid over the years? A couple of hundred, hundred grand. Don't you think I earn, I, I've earned the right to have the pension? After eight months of saving, Bob is finally ready for his operation. And tomorrow morning, his cataract will be removed. It's not easy, but I think, I think a lot of people make living on the pension harder for themselves because smoking, drinking and gambling. They are the three that take your money. I don't drink, I don't gamble and I don't smoke. The only person I can blame for living like this is myself. I can't blame the government. I can't blame that person. I can't blame the council. Years ago, I should have saved my money. And I wouldn't be in, in this situation now. On average, a car is set on fire every three days in Wagga. Oh, terrible dirty job. Third one today. Losing a car is rough, but that is nothing compared to having your home set alight. Frank and Tina have lived locally for over 20 years and have seen it all. There's been that many burnt here. Around the years. Around in the Ashmont area, burnt houses burnt everywhere. In suburbs Ashmont and Tolland, vacant housing commission properties are easy targets for arsonists. None of us can go out for a nice night out to have tea or anything because there must be somebody always in the house. There's not going to be any houses left here soon. They're going to burn the bloody lot down. Having witnessed dozens of arson attacks over 20 years, Frank and Tina have their suspicions about who's responsible. Obviously, it's a lot of these juveniles that are burning them down. I don't know whether it's drug related or they're just doing it because they can do it and get away with it. Frank spent most of his life as a station hand in the bush, but he's retired now and keeps an eye on the neighborhood. Oh, I think these kids were breaking into a house on the corner. That's all. There aren't any juveniles, only little fellas, only probably nine or 10, you know, sort of kindergarten. They're just starting to learn the trade, that's all, you know. Give them a few years when they're 15, 16, 17, cracking on the ice. Mate, they'll have to get serious about it, then they'll be stealing the big stuff. But now they're just apprentices, they're just learning. You know, that's why the coppers will give them a little slap, a little tap on the wrist and I ain't going to do it again tomorrow. <laughs> so, that's, that's life, that's Ashmont. That's the way it goes. Years of living in Ashmont have given Frank and Tina a unique perspective on crime in the area. Yeah, there's, there's disenfranchised people here. You, you can't condone what they do, but at the same time, you've got to try and understand why they do what they do. This is a generational thing. This isn't just a new generation of kids that popped up and say, this is what we're gonna do. Right, they're, 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 this is probably third, maybe, push and fourth generation of being in this situation, you know? Yeah. Uh, they don't have the nice flash stuff. They don't have the opportunities given to them. I don't, for a minute, blame the kids in a lot of ways. They didn't set out to be like this. I think we as a bloody society, we made them like it. You know we made their parents like it. At the same time, you've got to feel sorry for the people who are victimised, for the, oh, you know, definitely. the people who've gone to work and work 10 and 12 hours a day to buy the car, to buy the house, to buy the TV, whatever, and someone comes in and, you know, takes just takes it, it yeah. and destroys it. Uh, that's that's got to be pretty heartbreaking for people. It's, it's got to be really upsetting for them. A 
few blocks away in neighbouring suburb Tolland, Mason and Catherine are still recovering from their recent break-in. Um, I still got it. Like every time I walk through the door, I get a yucky feeling, and want like be, want to be sick and shit. Their priority is to make the house safe for two-year-old daughter Susanna. Yeah. Uh, well, this is the first time she's come in the house. Literally, like I think the biggest plan is just to try and um get the kitchen and lounge room emptied and do it up a bit. Yeah, I know you want to clean. You cleaning? Thank you. You want to get your cloth and you can clean your stool. They were generous and left one behind. <laughs> <laughs> Look, what's that? Your TV? <laughs> when I fell pregnant with Susanna, I was only just starting to pick my life up again. Because I'd sort of gone, I wouldn't say off the rails, but I certainly had got myself into a hole. Drinking and taking drugs. Mummy? Yeah, Mummy has to do that one. I had to quickly pull my head luck like, in and start thinking about like what I wanted. Yeah, maybe we can get someone to paint it. Yeah, bro. Having worked hard to get their life on track for Susanna, the break-in has Catherine feeling like she's going backwards. But I still am not, yeah, I'm not feeling comfortable at all. Some people say get the heck out of there. It's, it's okay that you don't feel safe. Zianna, everything is just, you know, I don't know if I'll, I feel safe here at all. Like, I don't even know if it's the whole town now has taken it. You know, I don't know. Susanna's getting to three, like, do I want her to go to school here? Do I want her growing up in this community? Do I not, you know? Catherine fears if they leave the house, they might become the target of further attacks. I just wish I could um, pack up the house and know that it's, it's going to be here. So I think if I was guaranteed that my home would, you know, that what's left would still be here, then I'd go for a little bit. But I'm just too scared that what little I've got left would be taken to or <laughs> destroyed. Oh, that's all I've got left. <laughs> Too skint to move out and too scared to stay put, the worry is taking its toll. Two hundred and fifty kilometres southwest of Wagga is Daniloquin. With no rain and only a month or two of feed and water, Barry and Rosie are staring down the prospect of eventually having to sell the farm. Where are your boots? Don't just spoke to you, didn't you? Yes? We're looking for Lincoln's hat. After a lifetime of work, it's hard to think of letting go. Uh, I don't think it's going to rain. Uh, no, it's, it's reality, isn't it? You know, you know I'm, I'm only 54, but um, I've been doing roughly 80 hours work a week for 30-something um, years. Strapped for cash, they've had to let their evening workers go. So Rosie steps in. I didn't think I'd have to do it full time because uh, we had workers, but yeah, things change. You got it? With no one to watch the kids, Lincoln and Annabella are also off to the dairy. All right, we better get going, hadn't we? OK, children spend uh, most mornings and evenings at the dairy. And, you know, to the majority of Australians, that would seem very strange that you children, but that's what they're used to. Barry gets the cows with Annabella, and me and Lincoln come up and we start the milking, and then Barry comes and joins us after we've got the first rock on. With one eye on the cows. You sure? Why are you rubbing your eyes? And one on Lincoln. Rosie has her hands full. Let me know when you got it together. It's not enough money to pay somebody to come in. Two years ago, we had morning and afternoon milkers. 
Yes, it took a fair bit of um, getting her used to the idea you could be a mother and a dairy farmer. Yeah, it was a little bit foreign, that idea to Rosie for a, a little while. On average, 20 children under 15 suffer fatal injuries on farms each year in Australia. Oh, yeah, you're always watching to see what they're doing just to make sure they're not yeah, sort of putting themselves in danger. And they're on a farm, there's just so much potential danger. Yeah, we used to have them in this pen that we've turned into a calf pen here. And Lincoln spent most of his um, time trying to work out how to get out. I allow them to know that this is work. It's not time for me to play, it's time for me to work. And they just have to entertain themselves. Yeah, most of the time you love them. There's certainly some times when you, um, yeah, they do things that well and truly annoy you. Barry and Rosie know firsthand what it's like to almost lose a child. Uh, this is where Lincoln got stuck back in January last year. He followed me out into the pit at the end of the milking. The rotary platform was sort of going around for the final uh, time to get it into the right position to put the water through. And, and I didn't realise I kept on going down the yard and um, I got to the bottom of the yard and then we Heard the screams, and um, yeah, he was stuck in the rotary platform. And luckily, Rosie was in the right spot where she could just jam on the, the brakes. So he was jammed, sitting on this, jammed underneath this bar. Yeah, so it was. Like, you know, there's, there's just a tiny bit of movement in that, and yeah, he was just absolutely squashed. And yeah, we were, yeah, I came in from the top and Rosie was at the bottom and um, it was only Lincoln screaming at us to reverse it. Because <laughs> we had no, yeah, I thought I was going to have to get the angle grinder out and cut him out. But yeah, Lincoln just kept on telling us to reverse it, which we did. Yeah, how did you get to hospital? And with him, we got to run, 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 run. Yes, you are in a helicopter, weren't you? Lincoln's body was wedged between two metal bars. His muscles and tiny frame were squashed. Over 12 months on, there's still the possibility of long-term damage. We've been waiting now for six months to um, get an appointment in Melbourne for them to do a biopsy of his muscles for us to learn what, you know, what the outcome is going to be. Yeah, you know, it, it... If he is just going to you know, slowly lose his muscles, no, I, I think that would make the decision to give up head staring a bit easier. Yeah, so your family is the most important thing. You realise as you're getting older, and you know if there is something wrong with him, yeah, he'll come first. Three weeks after having his cataract removed, today is an important day for Bob. Today is my big day because uh, today is my, hopefully, it is my last visit. He needs to see his specialist for an update on his condition. It's still a bit sore when I touch it there, so I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure whether he'll, whether he'll he'll give me the all clear because the eye has to be perfect. And I just don't want to pack up and leave without the all clear. <laughs> if the results aren't good, Bob's eyesight could deteriorate. And that means living the way he has been is out of the question. I'll see you when I come out. Hello, oh, hi. Well, I've just seen my uh, seen my registrar. Unfortunately, as I t as I expected, the news is not good. Uh, 
I haven't been cleared to do to go back bush again or go back to my previous lifestyle. So I'm stuck in Wagga now for an, where I am camping for another four weeks. He's been instructed to keep his eye clean, which is not easy when you're camping by a main road with no running water. And for Bob, the alternatives don't bear thinking about. Asking me to give up my push bike and go and live in a flat, right, it's just like asking a duck, you can't go and swim and can't go in the water because your toenails have just been painted and you're going to ruin your toenail paint. No, that's not going to happen. Back at Wilkes Park and fellow camper Kev delivers more bad news. The rangers are real early and they, they come down there. I'm a whack, but they don't. Yeah. They come down there and they were to see you, I suppose, and then they went down the back there. And what'd they do down the back? I don't know. You they, don't know? They had a yarn down there and that was it. Camping for over eight months is against council regulations. So I'm starting to wonder whether the, whether the council is trying to get rid, trying to get rid of me and then, and then trying to get rid of everyone else. If the rangers return, Bob's keen to get his facts straight. Well, we got here, see, as you can see, Wilk Park's condition of use, as I thought. It's got the maximum period of use of allowed is self-contained vehicle of 72 hours. Some people have been here more than 72 hours. Some people have been here for bloody months and weeks. There's plenty of people breaking the laws. Why are they picking on me for? Is there, have they got something against me or something like that? What harm is there of me staying here? What harm am I doing? Two weeks after having their house broken into, life is slowly returning to normal for Mason and Catherine. They're not stickers. Yeah, they're not stickers, they're tattoos. Okay. Yeah. Mason is unemployed and looking for work. But today, he's doing odd jobs around the house. Front door service. And with the temperature expected to soar well into the 40s, his next job is to move the aircon from Susiana's room into the living room. Mason! Oh, we can't tell out the window. Mason! It's, all, it's still good. Mason! <laughs> it is not good! It is not funny! <laughs> That's the only aircon we got! It just fell out the window! <laughs> it's not funny! Oh, oh there's me fucking black bin. What bin? There! The one we pick up dog shit with. This is what happens when he tries to do things himself. Well, you know what? Meet me at the other window, because I'm going to lift it up from this end. All right, then. Move, dog, before you get run over by an air conditioner. You're going to break your back, Mason. You've got a bad back. Your yeah. back is stuffed anyway. Stop! No! That's as far as you're going to go. Can we wait till we get some help? Who boy? The aircon's going to be outside the house now. I hope you're happy. We had a little bit of cooling, now we've got none. What the fuck did you do? <sighs> Don't smash my window. Wait, Mason. Don't let it go backwards again. <laughs> All right, come forward, come forward. Ah! Lift, 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 Mason. Ah! <laughs> Carly, get baby. Yeah. Something's got the back. Is that going to be too high? Well, mate, anything's better than nothing right now. Oh, it is a little bit high, but we'll build it up from this side. Yeah, done. <sighs> In Denny, three hours drive southwest of Wagga, it's 8.30 at night. Let's go, girls. 
and the evening milk is finally over. Another long and tiring work day draws to a close. Sit down in his chair. Good boy. What time is it, Langton? Bedtime. Time to get a watch, Daddy. Less interrupted. You once was a small boy called Lincoln. No, Mum. His house was next door to the old people's home, and he knew the people who lived there. After 16 hours on her feet. Night, Lincoln. See you in the morning. Good morning, Mummy. Rosie finally sits down for dinner. Quarter to ten. Right. <laughs> I'm so late, Barry. With only a month or two of feed and water for the herd, Barry and Rosie need rain or they'll be in serious trouble. Yeah, you, you, we look at the weather probably about three or four times a day on the weather channel. So, yeah, you just hope something's going to happen. With each passing day, the future of the farm is fading. Unless something unbelievable changes, yeah, there's not a lot of future for dairying. Yes, Lincoln. In Wilkes Park, North Wagga, Bob's had a restless night. When I got home yesterday, and I was told about the cancel snooping around my tent and everything. Uh, nothing much has happened. This morning I was up early, I was up at six o'clock, I had my bath and everything. But you never know, they might just spring, come around a bit earlier than, you know, than normal. Council rangers were seen looking around Bob's camp and in the light of day, he's convinced they'll be back. I've been here nearly uh, eight months. I would like to stay here a little bit longer until I sort, until I sort myself out. Here comes the ranger. Here comes the ranger. There he is. That's him. <laughs> After one lap of the park, oh, he's just driving off. Bob's off the hook. I was expecting him to come over, but no. At least for now. Oh, dear, this guy. It's unusual. I don't know what to make of it, you know? Because he normally comes down and drives around here, then down there, and then drives around between the caravans. But he didn't do that. With the ranger gone, Bob's back to his old self. I'm always smiling. I'm always like this. I see that fella there. That's my friend. I feed him, I feed him three times a day, I do, or when I'm here. And look at him, he's getting nice and fat. I was going to um, lop his head off for, for Christmas dinner, but I never had a pot big enough. He's, he's waiting for tea. Hang on, quack, quack. After sleeping on the threat of eviction for a second night, Bob's hatched a new plan. I'm packing up and moving my stuff over the fence into Crown land. If I move over onto Crown land, just on the other side of the fence there, they can't touch me. Nobody can touch me. Crown land falls under a different jurisdiction to council land, which means the park rangers won't be able to move Bob on. I have to move because if I don't, they're only going to bring the police down. And that's the last, and that's the last thing I want. Bob's found a solution to his council problem. Ants but it means the end of eight months of stability. It's like everything I do, I just laugh it off. Laugh it off as, as another, another experience in life. I mean, the council's only doing their job, you know? So 
Yeah, so I mean, I, I, got, I got really nothing to complain about. With his short-term housing situation sorted, a long-term solution requires more thought. I've got to think, I've got to think, do I want to go back and live in society? Or do I want to live in the bush where I can do my own thing? It's a tough decision. Oh, no. I've been on the road for 41 years, camping on te in tents and every day, and never had a proper roof over my head with four walls, with hot and cold running water, electricity and gas. I've never had that for 41 years. So is this the life I want to live again? So we're off to a clearing sale of our, one of our local dairy farmers. Yeah, Dave has been in the area a lot longer than what I have, uh, but due to the circumstances of the industry, and he's made the decision to exit the industry. And the farm's been sold to, yeah, as a cropping farm. With increased costs, one in four Australian farmers say they're likely to leave the industry within the next five years. Yeah, I'm getting the tractors and the machinery that can get used in other industries. It will still make really good money, but the actual dairy items there will be way undervalued. Everyone's looking for um, what they need. I'm a farmer and I need cattle troughs and whatnot. So you come and try and save a few dollars and um, go from there. You, know, you don't know people, we're all on the same boat, we're all doing the same thing. So we just, everyone re can relate to what's going on. Farmers have travelled far and wide to save a dollar. Some find bargains. For David, it ends generations of farming heritage. My uh, grandfather was um, one of the first settlers in the district. Been in the area all my life. Sold the farm to a cropper. Yeah, so we're getting out. Gonna go and work for someone. So, um, yeah. Just so uh, I can trace some of our cows, our generations back to mid 60s and not that I love the, each individual cow, but I've, um, I have love the, the group and uh, it's been tough. The feeder, I bought this, this plus the three old buggered ones for $40. We went to Denny a week ago because we needed a couple of tits in the $11 each. Barry's managed to pick himself up some cheap goods. Yeah, this is just an old trough, so it was five bucks. But seeing a fellow farmer leave the land casts a long shadow on Barry's future. It's reality. It really is reality. You know, I'm quite aware that um, the way things are going, dairy farmers can't compete anymore. Uh, it, it probably... Yeah, getting you rid of the cows will be the, the, the difficult thing. Talking to all the different farmers here uh, today, yeah, you just realise how important an autumn break is going to be this year. For Barry and Rosie, that break in the drought needs to come in a matter of weeks. It's been several weeks since the break-in, and although the house is cleaner and the locks have been changed, Catherine is still struggling to feel safe in her own home. No, since the break-in, I'm not, like, I, I don't trust many people around here anymore. I think I just want to get to a point where I feel strong enough mentally and physically to step out of the home a bit, because I struggle a shitload with it. You want to go to the park? <laughs> Catherine and Susiana are heading to the local park. Come here, I need to tell you something. But at the front door, a group of kids is blocking their way. Oh, Mason. What? These fellas here want the football. I want a new mirror. Family friend Ethan, who is visually impaired, 
along with Mason, had a run-in with the group earlier in the week. A ball was thrown, smashing the rear vision mirror of their ute. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, 60 bucks and you know the football. Well, that's how much it's going to cost for a new mirror. Hey! Well, who did it then? That's why well, the ball that's get in the car. That's why it's broken and how can, how, how the ball get in my car? <laughs> Mason, Ethan's on his own out there. Mommy! Come on. Hey. <clears throat> Get inside, you can't see, you dumb fuck. <laughs> Mason and Ethan's response leaves Catherine unimpressed. You go out there, I said they want the ball. You have to be a show off, big stand, or I'll give the ball back. Ethan thinks he's fucking Muhammad Ali. Yeah. There's been a phone call made the cops, so I suggest you just fucking move. After 15 minutes of taunts back and forth, Catherine's had enough. I'm sorry for it. What? You a dumb cunt, because he was going in the room to get the fucking football and you're still mouthing off your cheeky cunts. That's all right then. It's all right then. Keep being cheeky. He was going, he going into the room and get the ball, but you're still mouthing off. Yeah, but this is what happened, look. Look, look. The ball went in the fucking window after he hit the mirror. Who the fuck are you, mate? Fuck off. Well, we were getting the ball, but your mouth's still fucking going. I'll put a knife through the ball before you get it then, you little cunt. Facing the choice of 60 bucks for a new mirror or proving a point to the local kids, Catherine finally gives in. Kids these days don't like have any respect like they used to. Something as simple as knocking on a door and apology, you know, saying, oh, sorry for, you know, being a dickhead the other day on the road and, you know, smashing your mirror. Everything that Catherine does, like, whether she's getting shitty, it's all in, you know, reason. It's not just because she feels like getting up someone. You know, she's a caring person. She doesn't want any dramas, nothing to happen. A lot of kids around this area, they're just sitting on that line where they're either going to fall into the life that they'll regret when they're older, or they're gonna, you know, do something with themselves. Hopefully they don't come back or carry on. I'm, I'm hoping they, they'll just be cheeky kids. But my problem is I don't know. It makes me just want to get out. No matter where you call home, you'll do anything to protect it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's my door. How I'm going to cope moving back into society, I got no idea. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even con contemplate. You help Annabella Lincoln. Lincoln! Tell me, little five-year-old, that you know, farmers never give up. And he regularly repeats that to me. You know, he tells me that back. You know, farmers don't give up, Daddy. Hi, Daddy! <laughs> Next time on Struggle Street. They're on drugs. They couldn't steal it, so we'll demolish it. It's getting more and more dangerous to camp out. The drunkies, some of them have been bad, and I mean real bad bastards. Methamphetamine. It was an everyday thing. It was just a part of my life. It's just fucking shit. The boar stopped working over the weekend. No wonder it stopped working. For us, it's the end. 